Good afternoon and welcome to the 2020 Zoom webinar on the, the presidential election. For those of you who are new to our um, broadcast, my name is Joel Cassiola and I am a member of the political science department and I am um, delighted to say that I am the host of this Zoom webinar. And this week, uh, we are focusing our attention on American Foreign Relations Week 2. And the topics will be Europe, uh, Latin America, and the Middle East, or as one speaker uh, tried to argue last week, West Asia. And uh, he took exception to Middle East um, and uh, actually has some authority behind that position. Uh, the UN refers to what uh, most Americans uh, call the Middle East, West Asia as well. Before we get to our expert uh, panel, I want to make a couple of announcements. The first uh, concerns the second quiz uh, for all students taking the course for credit. Uh, I sent out an email, which you should have received. In case you didn't, uh, please uh, let me know through email uh, and I will resend it. It concerns the second quiz, which is now open for you to take and it will be open until November 11th uh, at 11.59. And the format will be the same as the first quiz, 20 multiple <coughs> choice questions uh, on weeks five through eight. And the topics for um, uh, these weeks for you to make sure you uh, watch uh, are education, immigration, healthcare, and inequality uh, in America. So please make sure you watch the recordings. Uh, and uh, if you did not do as well as you would like on the first um, quiz, uh, please uh, re-watch uh, the weeks and take notes so that you can improve your score. Um, if you have any questions about the quiz, don't hesitate to um, write to me. The second announcement uh, concerns next week. As I am sure everybody watching this webinar knows, uh, next week is um, election day. And on election night, the returns will come in. And uh, it's a custom for this course to have a special class on election night, observing the um, uh, results and commenting. And through the magic of webinars, in a way, uh, we can have more commenters, uh, commentators uh, than uh, ordinary. Uh, and I've recruited and asked the entire Department of Political Science and a few people outside the department to uh, join us uh, sometime during the evening because uh, everyone seems to think it's going to be a long evening. Um, I can use some help with your assistance in asking questions and making comments. I hope that we will have a very informative uh, and enjoyable watching and commenting on um, the results. 
So the class will begin as usual at 4 p.m., which is 7 p.m. East Coast time. And a couple of states will be closing. Uh, and as the afternoon here on the West Coast proceeds, we will get more results from the states. If you can't make it at four o'clock, please join us in progress uh, and we will be able to, um, uh, you'll be able to see what is going on at that moment. Uh, if you have any questions about next week's uh, special election coverage, uh, please um, write to me. For those of you who have been watching the recordings, there will be no recording next week. So please log on and join the election watching event. Okay, with that, let me just ask, Rabab, how are you doing with video? Uh, I see. It's not working. The sound. Okay. Works, the video. I'm gonna. I'm, I'm. No. No video. I don't know why. Okay. Do you want to? Speak? I can listen. Do you can... want to? Do you want to give your talk without video? Uh, maybe I could wait a little bit to come. Okay. Bit All right. Later. We will okay. change the order. Pardon us for some of these technical difficulties, and we will move to our uh, initially second speaker, uh, who will be our first speaker in this uh, revised version of the speaking order. Uh, and I'm delighted to introduce Professor Juanita Darling from the Department of International Relations. Professor Darling entered the academy after a long journalism career most recently as a Los Angeles Times correspondent in Latin America. A graduate of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in mass communication, Professor Darling is Professor of International Relations at San Francisco State. She is also the coordinator of the Latin American Studies Program. Following publication of her work on revolutionary media, including the book, Latin America, Media and Revolution, Professor Darling has turned her attention to Latin America, Latin American media philosophy with her most recent article on Jewish values in the journalism of Argentina's Alberto Gertrinov. Professor Darling, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me to be here to talk about the impact that this election could have in Latin America. In his rather uh, characteristically obscure way, um, President Trump in the last debate uh, kind of put uh, put the question to his uh, to the contestant with uh, Joe Biden, who built the cages? And in some ways, that question, for those who understood what he was referring to, kind of makes uh, encompasses the 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 whole issue of how much difference would a Biden presidency make for the region? How much how much difference would a re-election of President Trump make? And to try to answer that question, I want us to go through and look at regional policy, particularly migration, security, and trade, then look at the regional impact of international policy, especially climate change, and then finally move on to the issue of political culture. Now, first of all, I think we need to start with the fact that the US policy goals in Latin America have been the same for the past 197 years, ever since the Monroe Doctrine, and that is to protect US economic and security interests, especially to, opportun uh, to minim 
maximize opportunity, economic opportunity, and minimize the security threat. <clears throat> that is not going to change, no matter who is president. These are going to be the US policy goals. Those goals have changed minimally, again, over the past two centuries. During the Cold War, they were manifested in uh, trying to keep out Soviet bases, arms, and influences, and alliances. And today, we see them in a desire for political stability, to avoid refugees mainly, uh, regional peace, protection of the Panama Canal, which US shipping interests still use uh, a lot, and to promote trade. So these old, same old goals can be seen in free trade agreements, on security agreements about the war on drugs and gangs, and also about migration and remittances, because remittances play an important role in stabilizing the Latin American economies. And again, no matter who's president, these are going to be the concerns. The US has a couple of different tools for trying to um, enforce or carry out these policies. There's, there's a hard power, which is economic assistance and military assistance and soft power, which is influence. Um, that can be seen through things like uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's good neighbor policy, the kind of Disney uh, film initiative that accompanied FDR's policy. And this has been very successful. In fact, you know, when uh, John Kennedy went to Costa Rica, the Costa Rican government actually made a stamp of him. Uh, and during the mid 20th century, this, the, you, the use of soft power was extremely effective in Latin America. That has generally been um, made less important in US policy than hard power, which is kind of a shame because at the time there have been opportunities like Obama's election was an opportunity to use soft power that really was not explored as fully as it could have been. So let's look, take a look, first of all, at migration policy. And as President Trump referred to in the debate, there, is, there are arguments to be made that some of the Trump policies are simply extensions of policies that already existed. The, there were pretty, the, there were draconian um, sort of uh, endpoint of of policies that were created in the Obama administration and before. Uh, the Obama administration indeed built those horrible cages that we saw um, because of the influx of child migrants during what, the third year of the Obama administration. And then they were there when the Trump began the family separation policy and filled, and filled them with children. Um, actually, deportations have been down under Trump. The only, only the, in the last year of the Obama administration were deportations at the same kind of low levels that they have been under Trump. Uh, Obama was very, very strict. And the Obama administration was very, very strict and very, very active about deporting people. But it was in some ways more selective because of the concerns about security interests. The Obama administration realized that removing uh, temporary protected status would have been really a security issue for the area and never suggested doing that, even though um, but that was, it was a tr uh, an effort that Trump tried to make. And he was finally um, blocked only by, uh, by the courts, by judicial, by judicial review that said that, you, that this is just illegal, you can't do what you're planning to do. So, he, so Trump has really pushed these policies much further 
and of course the family separation was, was really ex exaggerated. In addition, there, is the, there was a the question of the Remain in Mexico program in um, response to the refugee crisis that has had the effect, has had two really uh, damaging effects. One is creating a series of refugee camps on the US-Mexico border. And uh, these are really, I mean, they aren't sponsored refugee camps. There is very little aid for them. Conditions in these camps are, are terrible. And in addition to this, Trump, by forcing Mexico to go along with these policies, he, ha he has seriously undermined the Mexican president. Now, whatever you think of AMLO, it is probably not in the US's best interest to have a president with, who has lost the confidence of his population right, sitting on the US border. And Trump has seriously undermined AMLO, who had promised to, uh, to protect Central American immigrants. Now, in addition, fortunately, we can see because of the fact that Biden was vice president and he was in charge of uh, the Obama administration uh, policy on the Central America. And he actually makes reference to that in his own campaign mirror, uh, materials. We have a pretty good idea of what he would do. <clears throat> and he says that basically what he did in Central American vice pres as vice president is what he would do now. This meant create, he created a program that talked about reform of police systems, the expansion of community senators, centers, reducing poverty, and trying to attract foreign investment and targeting smuggling networks. Um, but mainly what happened was support for the existing police system because as we're all finding out now, it's pretty hard to reform police systems. And also for uh, targeting uh, enforcement against smuggling networks. <clears throat> there was actually very little done to expand community centers or re really reduce poverty. Uh, there, the idea of attracting foreign investment just meant uh, really uh, tearing down the very few regulations that actually exist in uh, the region about foreign investment and had very little, didn't do very much to affect, uh, affect po poverty. Nevertheless, oh, sorry, I lost my thing. Nevertheless, the program was deemed pretty effective. Um, and I lost that slide, sorry about that. Uh, but it was deemed pretty effective at the time that Trump ended it in his first year, the first year of his presidency. In terms of trade, uh, the only major change, the only changes that uh, Trump has really made have been uh, converting NAFTA into the USMCA. The big difference between those, that agreement was the amount of uh, local content in auto manufacturing and the fact that it has a sunset clause. Uh, none of the other uh, trade agreements that the Obama administration made in Latin America have been changed at all. So we're not, we really haven't seen very much change in that front. The big difference really for Latin America is in international policy and in climate change policy. If we think that the fires here in California were devastating, they were horrific in Latin America. Uh, this, the red area in this map is an indication of the parts of the Amazon where there were fires. Um, besides the tremendous fires in the Amazon, which are because of climate change, although many were provoked by human actions uh, like slash and burn agriculture, um, in addition to that, climate change is drying up the lakes in Bolivia. Those, uh, those lakes are ice fed 
And um, basically that's, that's gonna be gone. Those are gone. I mean, there is, there's nothing that probably that can be done at this point to restore those, uh, those lakes, to restore the ice that, that created them. And Bolivia is one of the major sources of climate, of climate change refugees. It's one of the precursor countries. Uh, they, and this is, this is going to continue. This is like the, the islands that have been flooded over. They're not coming back, uh, but it could ostensibly um, be kept from getting worse. As far as political culture, um, Biden is, Biden's policy on Venezuela has the same end game as Trump, which is pushing out Maduro. It's still kind of that Cold War uh, attitude of pushing out anything that looks like um, leftist influence. Um, although Biden says that he would take a different approach he would use stronger multilateral sanctions instead of going it alone. And he would also grant TPS status to Venezuelans in the United States, allow them to stay legally and offer to support to countries like Colombia, which is a historically a strong US ally, uh, which are caring for billions of Venezuelans. So it's a more, he would take a more cooperative approach in, in working with this issue. Maybe one of the biggest differences is in the culture of nepotism that has been characteristic of Latin America and has generally been condemned by the United States. Uh, this is a photo that was taken with Trump, President Trump, uh, Jair Bolsonaro, the uh, president of Brazil, and Bolsonaro's son Eduardo at the time that Bolsonaro was putting him forward his son forward as ambassador to the US. Uh, that was finally, that was stopped after a court case was filed and the senators in Brazil refused, said, made it clear that they would not confirm someone whose only foreign experience was working at a Popeyes in Maine as their ambassador to the United States. Nevertheless, um, those the repercussions of of Trump, the Trump Bolsonaro uh, kind of partnership have gone even further. Uh, today, the New York Times spoke about how how the two of how the two presidents together have worked to create um, a greater crisis than needed to be in um, in COVID. Um, and it goes back to this question of security. Previous administrations have felt that health issues in Latin America were important because it's so easy to move those kinds of health problems up to the US from Latin America. <clears throat> but nevertheless, you've talked, you've heard your health experts talk about the reper repercussions of health policy in the United States and try to imagine what those would be like in a, in a region where people are back dirt roads from, um, from any kind of health clinic, much less a fully equipped hospital, where the pre-existing conditions are not uh, being obese, but being undernourished. Um, the, COVID-19 has devastated Latin America, and it's in large part because of actions that Bolsonaro and Trump took in concert to defund the regional health agency that has normally been called to help in these kinds of crises, um, trying to push a cure that isn't a cure, and um, eliminating uh, doctors in the region. Perhaps the most sobering thought is that as Trump has adapted to Latin American political culture, we're beginning to see signs of that in his refusal to confirm that he will accept the election results. And, as, and because of his refusal, 
people are now beginning to talk a little bit about the possibility of a self-coup. And of course, the Latin American example of what happens when you have a self-coup is the Fujimori regime in the 1990s that resulted in huge um, corruption and also human, tremendous human rights violations and genocide. And given the, the, the culture of fear that's being created uh, through by the Trump campaign, this seems like a concern that we might have. Um, so, Again, when we think of these possibilities and we look at these two different campaigns, we need to think of them in terms of what does this mean for protecting US economic and security interests? Is this going to increase economic opportunity for the United States? Is it going to diminish the third security threat? Thank you for your time. Thank you, Professor Darling for that excellent slideshow and narrative. And um, I see that Rabab is still not visible uh, and she's not on the audio. So I think we will move to Aaron. There you are, Rabab. I am on the audio, but I cannot get video. So I mean, I'm even okay. going to put the picture while I'm speaking, so people can pay attention, but that's okay. I can, you know, however you want to All do right, it. we will be flexible. Uh, mm -hmm. And let me uh, introduce you, even though we can't see your lovely face, but um, we will be um, uh, flexible in reacting to the technical issues. Um, Professor Rabab Abdulhadi, uh, received her PhD in sociology from Yale University. And she holds the title of director and senior scholar in the Arab and Muslim ethnicities and diasporas studies, a program at San Francisco State. Here, her research interests include Palestine, gender and sexuality, critical race theory, nations and nationalism, colonialism, resistance, and Zionism. A, a recent publication of Professor Abdulhadi's is Israeli Settler Colonialism in Context, Celebrating Palestinian Death and Normalizing gender and sexual violence in feminist studies. Professor Abduhadi, please give your uh, audio presentation on the Middle East. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dean Cassiola, and I'm, uh, I'm happy to be here. I, I want to first acknowledge that we are meeting on Ohlone indigenous people's land. That's where San Francisco State sits. I also want to um, uh, protest actually that this is going on on Zoom. Uh, Zoom has, as a private company, has silenced and censored our classroom, open classroom webinar on September 23rd. I'm very uh, troubled that the universe did not fight this private platform and allowed them to actually veto the content of our classrooms and thus our academic freedom. I'm extremely troubled by that. And I'm, we're actually demanding that the university will fight, and especially because now we are actually uh, captive to Zoom, especially in the, in the, in the context of uh, COVID-19, where we don't really have much choice but to meet online. And I'm here because of you, Dean Cassiola, because I have been in your class ever since I've been at San Francisco State. I've been, I think, uh, over uh, four presidential, this is the fourth presidential election that we have a discussion. We huh. talked about Obama one, Obama two, Trump, one and hopefully not Trump too, but uh, okay, I'm allowed to I'm allowed to give my own political things because I'm my own citizen. So I'm let not me, a, uh, yeah. Professor Abduhadi, mm -hmm. let me yes. just interject uh, for the viewers of this webinar. Uh, 
Professor Abdul Hadi is protesting uh, actions done by Zoom Corporation in uh, interfering with a webinar that she was hosting. And I asked her to make an exception for this webinar to her boycott of Zoom. And I want to express my thanks to her for agreeing to make an exception to behavior that from an academic freedom's point of view uh, does seem uh, questionable. Uh, and I just want the viewers to know um, my personal gratitude for her appearing uh, this afternoon. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Dean Casula, and thank you for giving me those two minutes to actually get up and speak about that. I just want to say, actually, the boycott is kind of very difficult because we are, I mean, and something, I'm, I'm a Palestinian who grew up under Israeli occupation, so some of the things you really don't have a choice but to go through certain things because this is, this is how our life is. So what I wanted to talk about actually were four points today. I wanted to one, uh, speak about the whole question of Trump uh, Pence, Biden, Harris uh, position and the whole electoral issue around the question of Palestine per se. Secondly, I wanted to talk about the popular sentiments that are contesting that. Third, I wanted to talk about the potential for change. What happens on November 4th? Basically, come, we go to sleep. What happens November 4th, irrespective of who wins and on what basis? So first I wanted to say, I think many people already know that probably in your class and our speakers will also speak about that that uh, there is a very, there in, in, uh, for, for uh, the question of Palestine, sometimes people don't think there is much difference, but I think there is a nuanced difference in the sense that uh, what was hap what's happening with uh, Trump, we have never actually seen more pro-Israeli right-wing uh, administration as this administration. Historically, the United States, and I will follow what Professor uh, Darling uh, actually talked about the history, Historically, the United Place has actually been very much uh, one-sided around the whole question of Israel. There have been, been much difference between the Democrats and Republicans. And I also want to say that I don't really think that there's only two options. Now there are two options, but that's not necessarily inevitably what should happen in the future. But historically, there have been uh, unified around that. Unlike, for example, uh, policies in the other places of the world, for example, around Vietnam, there was a huge division we have not seen that, but we've seen changes after, after the Vietnam War in terms of the changes to neoliberalism from the welfare state in the US. I'm not going to talk about that because you've already discussed that in your class, but that has a lot of connections around what will happen with the question of Palestine. Trump has a very strong relationship with the Israeli uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, who's also indicted and who's also questioned about his own corruption. Uh, the Trump is very much connected with the right wing and his the three Troika who began uh, working for him are also very much invested in Israeli colonies and what people would say the settlements. Trump has moved the embassy from the US embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. He blessed the Israeli annexation of the Golan Heights and of the Jerusalem. Uh, Trump has cut off US funds from the UNRWA United Nations Relief and Work Agency for Palestinian refugees. Trump also has bypassed Palestinian leadership. However, we are critical of it, and I'm very critical. We have spoken about that before. And Trump has been very has issued something called executive order on anti-Semitism that basically equates anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism, which has to do with the censorship of our webinar. If we have time, we can discuss it. And Trump, even Trump's uh, the the Republicans like Pompeo, actually made his own speech to the Republican Party from Jerusalem, which actually bypasses even the protocols of it. Uh, by contrast, um, so there is, there is, uh, and then Trump comes up with this so-called deal of the century, which is not really a, a, a century, it's not really of the century, even though it might be seen as a deal because he's always trying to kind of like come up with deals and so on. But I should say also Trump is running the government as, a, as exactly according to um, a, co a failed corporation. So with the whole COVID and everything else, now with the with the question of the of the of the republic the Democrats Biden and Harris historically Biden and Harris have also had a very strong the Democrats have very strong relationship with Israel when Biden was vice president 
the United States government gave Israel the biggest assistant aid, $38 billion, the MOU that the Obama administration has given. Harris herself has spoken to the pro-Israel lobby, the APAC, the registered pro-Israel lobby, uh, APAC, and uh, supported them. She also, uh, ha the Biden himself says that if there was no Israel, we will have to invent an Israel. They, he promised the support for the Iron Dome, for David Sling, for the Arrow, for multiple uh, military weapons and so on. But there are some change, some, some things that have to do with what's happening in the Democratic Party per se. And that's really what I want to do, talk about because the, what's happening in the Democratic Party is very much reflective. And I'm not, again, I'm not actually saying this or this party or that, but it's very reflective of what's happening on the grassroots level in a popular US public opinion. US public opinion is moving much more and more and more towards more support for, with the Palestinians and more condemnation of Israel's colonialism, racism, and, and uh, occupation. And I specifically say Israel's colonialism, racism, and, and occupation, because I'm not talking about every single Israeli. I'm talking about Israel as what we believe as Palestinians to be a settler colonial state that established on the land of, of Palestinians. But there is a lot of changes in the, in, the, in the public opinion. And that has to do with Israel's intransigence and Israel's inability to actually enable any kind of possibilities. And Israel's supporters in the United States are actually in this kind of policies are actually unwilling to, to, to take any prisoners. I mean, it's kind of like the, the, with what happened with our webinar and so on. It's very, very clear. However, on a grassroots level in, the, in all public opinion polls show that there is a huge change on the popular level among people in the United States away from support for Israel towards actually more sympathy for the Palestinians. What's really troubling to Israeli supporters, to Israel supporters, is that many of the um, majority of the younger people are actually more sympathetic towards Palestinian rights. And more, me, more of the Jewish younger people are very much supportive of that. And I think why, and so there is something that is going on. There are changes that are going on. And this is kind of very long research, but I will talk a little bit about that and connect it with the whole politics of change that is happening within Arab American, Muslim American, Palestinian Americans and their supporters. So there is a lot of change that is, go some of it has, it's not coming from a vacuum, it, it continues a long time of organizing and so on. It has to do with a lot of time of organizing among people who are supportive, whether, whether you're talking about uh, widespread support within black communities, specifically around the uprisings, the Black Lives Matter, Matter and so on, among indigenous people, around people who are actually opposed to the uh, war border wall that uh, Trump wants to build, who are opposed to the undocumented captioning to the cages of the children and so on. And any, in, in, in short, people who are opposed to the right wing, very, um, we might even say, some people might say fascistic tendencies in this administration are actually there is kind of like gelling around the whole question of seeing Palestine as part and parcel of this um, agenda. But also there has been a very big change, shift in the, in the work among Palestinians in the United States and Arabs and, and Americans that is very different, that goes away from the cycle of four years, every four years people organize and so on. And also away from trying to establish what might be called an Arab lobby, which historically uh, there have been many mainstream people saying, well, let's create an Arab lobby, quote unquote, similar to the Jewish lobby. And I wouldn't even call it Jewish lobby because actually there are a lot of differences among Jews and there isn't one particular viewpoint, which we can talk about some more, but I'm, I'm not going to take time on it today. But there is also dependence on, historically there has been sort of hope that uh, money from the Gulf, petrodollars and so on, will come in and actually pay for towards financing an Arab lobby. And of course, A, it, it didn't, ne never really worked in 1990 when the United States invaded Iraq, actually. Many of these leading Arab American organizations bought, uh, bought ads in the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, New York Times, and supported the uh, Bush um, senior administration to do that. So that was one of the failures. That is a very big contradiction among the grassroots that support, that oppose intervention in the region. But secondly, also with the, with the normalization between United Arab Emirates, uh, Bahrain, and well, forget about Sudan. Sudan has no money. And actually Sudan normalized because it has no money. But they, there was dependence on that. That doesn't really work anymore towards actually support for Palestinian rights. But so it doesn't really work about having, quote, unquote, an official registered lobby. It doesn't really work. But what's happening is that there is a lot of changes on the grassroots. And I want to mention a couple of them. 
One is Bernie Sanders' campaign. Bernie Sanders, by the way, is lovingly referred to in among Arab Muslim and Palestinian circles as Ammo Bernie, meaning Uncle Bernie. And it's very interesting because it defies this whole understanding that Palestinians, Arabs, and Muslims are against Jews because here you have this very, very clearly identified Jewish uh, presidential candidate, older and so on, who actually resonated. And there, not everybody agrees with everything he's saying, but there is this loving um, um, relationship with him that, that opened up spaces for many people to be very much involved in the Democratic Party. I think also the changes that have happened with people like Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar, uh, Acacia Cortez, Presley, in the squad per se, but also later on with Cory Bush and others that is happening, Newman in, in, in Illinois. There is a lot of changes that are going on a grassroots level among Democratic National Convention delegates that actually 350 of them signed the statement to demand that uh, there is a different of opinion. Actually, people also write a wrote a statement to Biden to say to him that he needs to get rid of the, the these, these hoax that are pro-Israel, pro-Zionist uh, representatives and so on. And there is so there is a lot of changes that are going on. And also we saw cracks in Congress, which refers to what I was talking about earlier around the whole question that with Vietnam, it was there was uh, cracks, but with the with the uh, the reason there haven't been historically it's been really really difficult to do so but about two years ago there was a big debate in congress of course uh, the pro-israel sides won but around bds boycott divestment and sanction but we saw cracks on that we also saw cracks when there was the condemnation of ilhan omar we saw cracks when there was questions around islamophobia so we're seeing more and more cracks and it's very interesting because those cracks are corresponding to what's happening on the grassroots in terms of the United States. How am I doing with time, by the way? Because I'm actually trying to look at two screens at the same time. I'm yeah, okay? 10 okay. minutes will so, be fine. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, so there is this the, these kind of changes that are happening on a grassroots level that are coming very much reflective of the changes in the United States. So uh, on one hand, there is this kind of like, uh, the, 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 some of them have to do with the younger generation of people. And I go back to Obama, that the people who elected Obama, they were the first time voters. They have never ever voted before. And, the, and I believe that the reason Obama was elected first time and second time as a black man in the White House, and I have a lot of reservation, a lot of criticism of the Obama administration. I share the whole question of actually increased, uh, increased uh, uh, incarceration, increased uh, picking people at the border, increased, uh, um, increased neoliberalism, increased uh, dropping of the welfare state and so on and so forth. But what was very significant about Obama that we actually see today in the voters who are actually organizing is that he, the, the voters who voted in 2000 and 2012 were younger people who have never ever experienced Jim Crow or the impact of Jim Crow. They could imagine having a white um, black man in the White House. They could imagine having something different aside from white, male, liberal, rich, millionaires, and so on and so forth. And this is, I believe, why uh, Bush, uh, not Bush, uh, Trump and company came in with a vengeance, came back with a vengeance. And this is also the, 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 the base of the white supremacist roots that it is there is a vengeance. It is even though people are actually not being satisfied in the Trump policies and the whole uh, loss of jobs and, and really the failure of the, of the whole economy and the collapse of it, it is there is something that is gelling them. But by contrast, and this is where we come in, is by contrast, there is something very changing around people coming together and not seeing Palestine as something that is very distant. And this is one of the main issues that is, I think uh, we're discussing it here, quote unquote, as foreign policy, but I actually want to shift it towards a different kind of imaginary. That if you think of Palestine as a foreign policy issue, if you think of Palestine as something exceptional, if you think of Palestine as somewhere else, of course it becomes only of interest to quote unquote foreign policy experts, State Department, people who are graduating and become career diplomats and so on. But if you actually say it is not just a foreign policy, it's not an, an, and it's not a domestic policy. I have a problem between the foreign domestic di divide, you know, kind of like I argue against that. But if you think of it as a question of justice, if it becomes much more resonant and much more relevant to other uh, questions of justice. And, I, and, and, and so, and if you think of Palestine as not exceptional, and if you think of Israel as not exceptional, but you actually think of questions that which, pro-Israel uh, groups will talk about 
for example, the question of anti-Zionism, the question of anti-Semitism and so on, and seeing that as exceptional, but actually seeing that as part and parcel of the struggle against racism and all forms of racial discrimination, rather than seeing it exceptional and setting, setting it aside, the whole imaginary changes, the whole imaginary shifts around how do you think about Palestine? How do you think about things that might be far away? But you actually, and this is something that in the 80s, the Central American movements after actually have succeeded. In the 1980s with the anti-apartheid movement, it succeeded in not making it quote unquote a foreign policy issue. And you, you, go, you go ask anybody, nobody will say to you, oh, the apartheid in South Africa is actually a foreign policy issue. We shouldn't be really concerned about it. The same thing with Palestine. We shouldn't be concerned about it. Now it is no longer considered, and this has historically been part and parcel of one of the mainstays of the pro-Israel lobby. And I, now I'm talking about the official one. I'm talking about APAC, and I'm not talking about J Street per se. That considering Palestine a foreign policy, it doesn't really concern you. Why would you want to deal with it? This is about, you should really think about bread and butter issues. You should think about your jobs. You know, people of color shouldn't really be concerned. Black people, why are you talking about Palestine and so on? And so historically, and then Jewish people shouldn't be talking about it because there is anti-Semitism, et cetera, et cetera. This is not working anymore. What is happening is that the consideration of Palestine as a question of justice, as part of the framework of the indivisibility of justice actually, is working to bring all these groups together in order to understand what's going on. And it's very, very interesting because every single time, for example, Rashida Tlaib ran in a primary against not, not, a, not, not a white person, she ran and the woman who was against her was a black woman, but it was a more conservative black woman. And majority of the people who voted for Rashida Tlaib in Michigan were, were not only Arabs, there were many of the black constituents because she fought for water in Flint. She fought for jobs. She fought for welfare rights. She fought for things of this sort. So there is, a, there is the agenda of the candidates is very much reflective of stuff that's happening on the grassroots. And the grassroots is actually also being attracted to candidates and holding them accountable towards this. I may want to speak, I, I know I don't have a whole lot of time left, maybe a couple of minutes. If you but could I wanted finish to, in one minute, yeah. Bob, that would be good. Yeah. Yeah, I, will, I wanted to, to wrap up with, so when you think about, this is the way the discussion, and I want to take it back to where I started my protest. For example, this congressman, Rick Lamborn, who actually was the one who, who targeted me and my colleague and actually uh, call, called, uh, labeled us and, 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 and uh, accused us of criminality, of actually criminality, that we might be in prison and so on because we hosted that webinar. When I looked at his agenda, He's from Colorado Springs. Every single part of the agenda, that is a right-wing agenda on climate control, on uh, the borders, on the uh, caging of children, on, uh, on Palestine, on marriage equality, on queer rights, on women's rights, on the whole question of bringing more people to arrest uh, um, uh, protesters in uh, Colorado and elsewhere. Every single part of his agenda fits exactly with Trump's agenda. And he even defended Trump against impeachment. By contrast, People who are actually rising and supporting Palestine, they're thinking about it around the whole question of the indivisibility of justice. And there is a very big coalition that's coming together that come November 4th, whoever wins, and I'm not saying which people shouldn't participate, shouldn't vote. I think this is really important. Voting is a right and it's very, very important for people to exercise their democratic right and participate and hold the government accountable. But come November 4th, it is not going to be every four years people will do something. People, I believe they're going to come up and they're going to organize and they're going to resist because it is actually, I don't think it's really an option. Justice is a right for everybody. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for Rabab. And I'm really uh, sorry that uh, we couldn't have the normal video, but I think your voice was loud and clear and incisive. So I appreciate your remarks and I appreciate your being here. Our next speaker, and hopefully we will have a video, is Professor Aaron Kaplan from the Department of Jewish Studies, who is the Goldman Professor in Israel Studies uh, at the Department of Jewish Studies. He received his PhD in history from Brandeis University. Uh, Professor Kaplan is the author of several books including the latest Projecting the Nation History and Ideology on the Israeli Screen, which came out earlier this year. Professor Kaplan.
Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. This is the third panel that I am uh, participating in as part of this uh, course. Right. Um, and, I, and I have vivid memories from our last meeting four years ago. And I recall that I was using the subjunctive throughout my talk. And, and the formula I used there was, if the polls are correct and Hillary Clinton is the president, then we can expect X, Y, and Z. So I'm not going to be Nate Silver this time around. I will not use the subjunctive. I have no idea what's going to happen on November 3rd. So that'll be the premise. But I will use the what if to start with by looking at the Democratic side. And I think that had Bernie Sanders won the primaries, I think that the issue of Israel, Israel, Palestine, the Middle East would be much more at the forefront of this campaign. Uh, because there is a sense that there are elements in the Democratic Party, and Bernie Sanders was at the forefront, who are offering a rethinking or new perspective with regard to those questions. But alas, they uh, did not win or prevail in the primary, so they're not leading the ticket. So really, this is not part of the campaign in the lead up to the elections. And in fact, by and large, I would argue that the Middle East, the questions related to the Middle East, have figured relatively very little in this uh, campaign. And by looking at the uh, debates uh, that we had on TV, again, hardly ever uh, mentioned. It had more to do with Russia and the Putin-Trump uh, relations than anything else uh, relevant to the region in my mind. But with Biden, I think that ultimately Biden represents kind of the democratic orthodoxy when it comes to uh, Israel and uh, the region. Uh, I, I don't think that he will bring about kind of a new revolutionary approach or a great change. If we learned anything from the time that he was vice president in the Obama administration, two times it tried to revive the peace talks, but it didn't seem that they brought a lot of energy or attention to it. It seemed kind of a pro forma effort to revive those talks, but it did not lead anywhere. So I would expect that based on what we know about Biden and Harris, that it'll be kind of a return to the more um, traditional position of the Democratic Party. And I don't see any major uh, breakthroughs. Um, if the only thing I can mention here is that as far as uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is concerned, his relations with Biden at times were a little problematic. Uh, when Biden visited Israel as uh, vice president, when Netanyahu was prime minister, while he was in Jerusalem, Biden, the uh, Housing uh, Planning Commission of the city of Jerusalem announced plans for a new neighborhood in East Jerusalem. Upon hearing the news, Biden packed his suitcases and made his way to the airport. And on his way, the prime minister issued a special apology and said that nothing will happen while the, the vice president is in, is in Israel. So there's a history of tensions between the two, but I'm not sure there's much to add beyond that, which leads us to the sitting president who already has uh, four years in power and some very interesting um, developments with regard to his relations to Israel. So I want to take us back to before the 2016 elections to the spring of 2016. So when Trump was running in the Republican primaries, one of his chief calling cards was the America first in foreign policy, meaning I will only pursue policies or plans that would benefit the United States economically. And to some regard, Perhaps we can understand his relation with NATO along those lines over the last uh, four years. But he brought this kind of a transactional approach to foreign policy. What can I get out of it? What kind of deal I can make? And in fact, he mentioned Israel a couple of times. And he said, if Israel expects to receive the type of support that it has been receiving, I want to see something in return. I want to get something back, which uh, organizations like APAC were very troubled by. Now, Trump was scheduled to speak at the APAC conference in 2016, but the day before he gave his speech, he had a meeting with Sheldon Adelson. Sheldon Adelson, the uh, casino magnet, is the biggest donor to Republican causes over the past uh, 10 years. He's really the kingmaker in Republican politics. I think in this election cycle, he's giving close to $100 million to various super PACs. We should also so, uh, say that he's the um, 
uh, major supporter of uh, Netanyahu, and he is the publisher of the most uh, circulated and read newspaper in Israel. It's a free newspaper, Israel Ayom, Israel Today, which is delivered free to the homes of Israelis. Can beat that deal. And it is basically a mouthpiece for the Israeli government. So if anybody wants to know what Netanyahu is thinking at any given moment, you just have to read this newspaper. It's basically written by his advisors. So as uh, Avigdor Lieberman, who was born in the Soviet Union, once said, this is like Pravda, but this would belittle the quality of Pravda at its heyday. <laughs> To, uh, Pravda. But anyway, so Cheryl Edelson had a meeting with Trump. The following day, Trump gave a speech before APAC, and it was a typical Republican speech regarding Israel in the Middle East. Full support for Israel and no questions asked. And indeed, when he came into office, it seemed that he delivered on all the points that Edelson and Netanyahu, one would assume, put forward and expected from him. First, he appointed an ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, who has a long history of supporting the settlements in the West Bank and is a close ally in Netanyahu and some of Netanyahu's friends. There was a moment last year when there was an event in the White House and David Friedman was there and there were several Israelis in the crowd. And, and Trump referred to Friedman, who's the US ambassador to Israel, looking at the Israelis, he called him, he's your ambassador. So nobody knew whose ambassador it is and whose interests he is representing in the region, which was uh, quite telling and quite interesting. But beyond the appointment of this uh, ambassador, as uh, my predecessor uh, said, he delivered on all the points. First and foremost, he withdrew from the uh, nuclear agreement with Iran, which was Netanyahu's number one issue with the US. Then the move of the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, Golan Heights, settlements, and a whole list of issues that were dear to Adelson and Netanyahu. He seemed to be to have delivered on all those uh, issues without expecting, it would seem, uh, too much in return. And of course, the latest development really has to do with the agreements between the UAE, Bahrain, Israel, and Sudan with Israel which also was seen as a gift to Netanyahu because Netanyahu certainly could present those agreements to the Israeli public and to the international community as a victory of his position, meaning these are agreements that are based on the formula of peace for peace. Netanyahu has been very critical and very much opposed to the formula that was developed by the UN Security Council in Resolution 242 in 1967, the land for peace. Netanyahu said there should not be a land for peace agreement. Agreements should only be based on peace for peace. And Netanyahu presented the uh, agreements as such to the Israeli public. Not only that, they also fall into the greater view of Netanyahu of the Middle East and the region and Israel's position in the region. If you read uh, and if you follow Netanyahu's uh, uh, speeches before the UN General Assembly every year, he pretty much repeats the same point. And the point is that it is it would be a mistake to reduce the tensions in the Middle East to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, that the conflict is really between Israel and the extreme elements in the region. And he gives a whole history of who the extreme elements are. And therefore, if you can create a coalition of those forces in the region who fight against those extreme elements, then you can achieve peace in the region. And over the past few years, the force of evil as Netanyahu presented in the region was Iran. Therefore, if you can find other countries who are willing to join the force of the uh, elements of enlightenment against Iran, then they could reach an understanding and agreements. And in this regard, those agreements really fall into Netanyahu's uh, worldview and really serve his interests. But what is the US getting out of it? And it is getting something out of it. Uh, if you remember, uh, Trump's first uh, foreign trip was to the Middle East and he visited two countries. He visited Saudi Arabia and then he visited Israel. And when he was in Saudi Arabia, he said something which was quite interesting. The one thing that one could appreciate about Trump is that there's no filter. So his inner truth comes out to the public. And he basically said, I'm here in Saudi Arabia because we can sign incredible arms deals that would bring tens or hundreds of billions of dollars to the United States. 
And if you read carefully the agreement between Israel, the UAE, and Bahrain, what Israel has agreed to in those agreements is to allow the US the sale of advanced uh, weapons to those countries, something that under older agreements, the United States was prohibited from doing. This mainly has to do with F-35 stealth fighters. So in a way, Netanyahu gave the green light to the US to sign arms deals with those countries that potentially would bring tens of billions of dollars to the, the United States. Uh, by the way, Saudi Arabia has not signed an agreement, but it is part of those agreements because uh, in those agreements, there, uh, there are gonna be commercial flights now. There already are commercial flights between Tel Aviv and the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. And those commercial flights, including those of uh, Israeli planes, are allowed to travel over Saudi airspace, which is a major deviation in traditional uh, Saudi policy. So Saudi Arabia is already part of this loop as well. So in this regard, Trump got his kind of transactional element from it. But those agreements created, to my mind, one of the most incredible political moments of, of, of this campaign. And it happened this past Friday. And so on Friday, when the US announced the agreement between Israel and Sudan, conversation with Netanyahu. And we're gonna see a clip from, a 20 second clip from this conversation because it tells you everything that you need to know about Trump and about this campaign and maybe a prognosis about what's about to happen. But if you want to understand the origin of the impeachment, you just have to listen to this because there is nothing like diplomatic protocol that, uh, that uh, Trump follows in any of his uh, uh, conversations with uh, foreign leaders. So he called Netanyahu and this is what happened. So I'm gonna share my screen now and I hope you can uh, hear and see it as I play it. Okay. Here it is. Can you see? And then the transcript is above the clip, so you can read and see what's going on. So I'm going to play it. Uh, do you think Sleepy Joe could have made this deal, baby? Sleepy Joe. I think. Uh, do you think he would have made this deal somehow? I don't think so. Well, Mr. President, one thing I can tell you is um, uh, we appreciate the help for peace from anyone in America, and we appreciate what you've done enormously. Yeah. Uh, do you think Sleepy Joe could have made this deal, baby? Okay. Just the, the, the look on Trump's face was uh, incredible here. He was looking for the ultimate transaction here. Let me use this as part of my campaign. But Netanyahu simply didn't give it to him this time around. And not that Netanyahu is shy from intervening in U.S. politics. If you re recall, in the lead up to the uh, nuclear agreement with Iran, Netanyahu spoke before Congress and basically attacked a sitting U.S. president while speaking in Washington. He had no qualms about it, of intervening in Washington in internal U.S. politics. But notice how reserved he was this time. I want to thank, and he emphasized the word everyone in the United States. So I think Bibi, who is very close to uh, Republican sources in D.C., I think he's hearing something about uh, the potential outcome of those elections. So he was very, very careful indeed, but who knows? I'm not, as I said, I'm not in the uh, prediction um, game here. Uh, and in fact, there's a, an ongoing frustration for Trump with the Jewish vote in this elections. I think he was really hoping to change the uh, voting patterns of the Jewish community in the United States. At one point during the campaign, he said, I have beautiful Jewish grandchildren. Why don't you love me? Basically, he was telling the Jewish community. But it seems based on uh, the most recent polling among Jewish voters is that Biden will receive 75% of the Jewish vote, which is fairly consistent over the last uh, five or six election cycles. But there is a major shift in the Jewish vote in the United States, which is fascinating. And it has almost everything to do with uh, the relationship between the Trump administration and Israel. So traditionally within the Jewish community, 
among Orthodox Jews, the split was about 60% Republican, 40% Democratic. Right now, it's about 90% for Trump within the Orthodox uh, Jewish community. So they are fully in the Orthodox, fully behind Trump, whereas in the non-Orthodox Jewish community, there is a move away from the Republican Party and Trump more so than it has been in previous election cycles. And the polling within the ultra-Orthodox community, they say it's almost exclusively has to do with the moving of the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. So with this regard, uh, Trump was very successful in recruiting new voters. He probably lost other voters in, in the Jewish community along the way, but we'll see how this develops. Which brings me to uh, November 4th. And if there was one country that in a way dominated a lot of the discussion in the uh, election campaign, it has been China and US-China relations. And it has to do with trade, it has to do with copyright and patents, it has to do with COVID. There are so many elements where China plays such a crucial role. And what is interesting is that in the near future, Israel will find itself in a very sensitive situation in the triangle of the US, China, and Israel. And one of the reasons is that Israel has very developed or elaborated economic relations with China. Uh, Israeli startup co uh, companies are doing a lot of business in China. China is doing a lot of business in Israel. In fact, two of the biggest companies in Israel right now are actually owned by uh, China. So the economic ties between Israel and China might be an issue if what we'll see is an escalating Cold War between China and the US in the next years. And it'd be very interesting to see if Israel pivots in any one direction as these uh, tensions unfold in the uh, future. Uh, so that's what I have to say. Thank you again so much for inviting me to speak. My pleasure. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kaplan. I don't think we've ever had a phone call uh, on uh, one of these webinars. So you've set a precedent, uh, even though it was very brief, uh, but as you said, it was telling. Our fourth and final speaker is Professor Scott Siegel of the Department of International Relations, where he is an associate professor. Professor Siegel has a PhD uh, from Cornell University in international relations, which is his field of study, along with the specialization of the European Union and comparative European politics. His research interests are in LGBT rights in Europe, party politics, anti-Semitism in Europe, and a recent publication is The Political Economy of LGBT Rights uh, in the Oxford Encyclopedia of LGBT Rights. Professor Siegel, you have the floor. You need to unmute yourself. Yes, yes, There yes. you go. I've done this a thousand times and still make this mistake. But thank you, thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you uh, uh, for everyone to paying attention through uh, all of our uh, discussions. And thanks for staying around for uh, me as, as your last uh, speaker, uh, who will be talking about US-Europe relations. And I think, as all the speakers have emphasized, is that this election is a turning point in many ways in the relationships between the United States and the regions that we're talking about. In some ways, uh, Professor Kaplan said, not much if Biden uh, is elected, and perhaps not much um, if uh, for Latin America, as Professor Darling suggested, but I suggest that this election is going to be um, pretty, pretty decisive for U.S. Uh, European uh, relations. So um, basically, uh, I want to look at U.S. European relations in, uh, can everyone see the screen? My yeah, it's good. PowerPoint. Okay, so uh, in terms of whether uh, this is just a marriage squabble we've had since 2016 or whether a divorce is happening. Uh, 
Um, and I'll just briefly review what US-European relations looked like uh, from 2008 to 2016. Um, the picture on the left with Merkel and Obama looking at each other into their eyes uh, portrays a marriage full of love and adoration that's probably a little exaggerated, uh, but yet is a good metaphor. While the picture on the right of Merkel, uh, Chancellor Merkel of Germany and Donald Trump uh, sort of typifies the relationship between uh, the two regions, although you certainly could find other photos that are even better uh, metaphors of US-Europe relations, depending on uh, your perspectives on the state of US-European relations, whether it's a state of awkwardness or whether it's a, a state in which things are splitting up. So as my students in my international relations classes would know is that I still love theory. Um, and so I first wanted to bring in a little bit about explaining when will alliances stay together and when will they come apart? And in IR, we tend to think that uh, there are three ways or frameworks to understand whether alliances will come together or go apart. One is that you could look at threats and security threats. And if there's a commonly shared security threat, alliances will stay together. If there is not a commonly viewed security threat, then they can come apart. Or do they have shared material interests? Do the efforts that they make to make themselves both wealthy bring them together? Or are they competitors with each other? Um, and this is specifically maybe about inter uh, international economic cooperation. And finally, despite maybe no security interests, common security interests, or no common economic interests, do shared values and identities keep them together or bring them apart? And certainly the last one is where Europeans and Americans are looking at each other more and more and saying, well, do we really have shared values and identity? And let me preface before I say this, is that when I say Europeans, that's ignoring the massive divergence there is in Europe today um, over perceptions of the United States. It's also assuming that I'm talking about the European Union when I'm saying Europe. Um, in the q and I'm perfectly willing to talk about non-European countries, sorry, non-EU countries lying in Europe and US-EU relations, namely the United Kingdom. Because now, when I say European, uh, as of last year, the UK is not European, although some would say that it still is, and some would say that it never was. So let's talk about shared security relationships before the election of Trump. There generally were shared security views with a few rough spots. Generally, NATO is the cornerstone of US-European relations. And almost no one would dispute that, that NATO is at that core. Um, and generally, lots of good cooperation between US and Europe in terms of military cooperation, uh, specifically in Afghanistan. And we've all lost sight of this, the longest war that America's ever been involved in. But US and European troops are still stationed there and they're still involved in what some would call state building in Afghanistan. But during the Obama administration, administration, especially in the last two or three years, the Secretary of Defense Gates and others really started getting louder with their grumbles about European contributions to NATO forces, specifically spending more on their own national defense. Now, in the Q&A, I can talk more about the details of whether or not Europeans really are uh, contributing to their share of the burden of security in Europe. And a lot of it, the uh, argument over whether or not they're bearing their share of the burden depends on what you think the security threat is. Um, and that's kind of lost a little bit in Trump's critique, which I'll get to later. But nevertheless, NATO was at the core despite some growing grumbling, there's an alliteration for you, growing grumbling about uh, the lack of Europeans contributing more to NATO's defense budget, if, if you call it that. Um, Russia basically was seen as a common threat okay, by both the Europeans and the Americans as the primary threat, particularly with the Russian invasion of Crimea in 2014. There is some leakage, no pun intended, over other issues like uh, the natural gas pipeline that Germany is building between Germany and Russia so that uh, natural gas can flow freely from Russia to, to Germany. 
And that's a point of tension, ironically enough, uh, today between Donald Trump and Chancellor Merkel uh, of Germany. But in general, Russia was perceived as a common threat. Iran, this is probably the sign of the greatest source of success and cooperation between the Europeans and the United States in foreign policy was the Iran nuclear accord, which was an accord that curtailed Iran's ability uh, to build a nuclear weapon within a couple years. This was an amazing success of cooperation between Europe and the United States vis-a-vis -vis one of the issues that has certainly um, divided the uh, United States and Europe in terms of how to treat the issue of Iran and its efforts to build a nuclear weapon. Then in the larger Middle East, North Africa uh, region, there's, there was successful military cooperation, security cooperation, intelligence cooperation to fight ISIS. Um, and then the Europeans took, quote, the lead in Libya. Uh, you may have remembered this famous uh, quote of Hillary Clinton is that uh, the European, the Americans will be leading from behind, meaning that the French and the British would be taking the lead and preventing Gaddafi from committing genocide uh, with American support in, uh, behind the Europeans. Then comes China. And here it's a little muddled, but both regions are muddled as to how to deal with China. In general, all both regions are, or both countries, if I want to use that term, uh, have to juggle issues related to, to trade with China, security issues with China, and human rights conditions in China. And in general, without going into it too much, I would argue that both the United States and Europe before Donald Trump uh, prioritized access to the Chinese market and trade with China over security issues and obviously, uh, or not obviously, but also over human rights issues. There are also other sources of great cooperation. First, we can underestimate the degree of economic interdependence between Europe and the United States. Um, the EU is the US's largest trading partner that has currently a $151 billion trade deficit. And I'll get into that, what that means in a little bit. The EU is the largest source of foreign direct investment of amount of $2.5 trillion. And they both really involved in, in co-economic governance of uh, the global economic system through the IMF, through the World Bank, generally successful multilateralism between the two in terms of governance. But there were tensions over agricultural trade, consumer privacy laws, tax havens, and big tech. One of the issues was the use of Ireland as a tax haven for Google and other tech companies, as well as Holland. And the United States, to some extent, the Democratic administration was increasingly upset that uh, Ireland and the Netherlands were becoming tax havens for Google's uh, corporate taxes, um, as well as Apple's corporate taxes. Um, so then the regulation of big tech would be a source of opposition. The US was a strong supporter and always has historically been a supporter of European integration and opposed Brexit and strongly told the UK that if you pursue Brexit and jeopardize the Good Friday Accords, which brought peace between um, the Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland, we are not going to be supporters of a free trade agreement with the UK immediately. So although President Obama did not want to directly involve the United States in uh, Brexit issues, he was trying to show his neutrality in the issue, he did voice concerns and believe that the UK's future lay with Europe and not outside of Europe. Also, President Obama and the US supported the bailout of Greece, although probably thought that the conditions that were imposed on the Greek government were too harsh. And then comes the next great success of European American diplomacy, and that's the Paris Climate Accord of 2016. Now, of course, the biggest problem that uh, divided or prevented agreement over the Paris Climate Accord was between China and the United States. And the Europeans were trying to get both countries uh, to come to some agreement over um, the standards for pollution and, and, um, and other goals. Um, but the Paris Climate Accord and getting the United States on board after the failure in Copenhagen in, in 2009 was a sign of great success of international cooperation. And then in general, both regions uh, had a commitment to diplomacy, advocating for human rights and democracy, so a sign of shared values. But then we have the election of 2016. And to be honest, for most Europeans, it was a big shock as it might've been for 
It was for me uh, in 2016, a big shock. And a lot of Europeans looked at Americans and said, hey, you know, we know you had George W. Bush from 2000 to 2008, and we we're really unsure about you Americans and your commitment to multilateralism and to human rights and to diplomacy. But you gave us President Obama and we gave him the Nobel Peace Prize in 2009 in exchange. Well, things have changed again. And I think Europeans, both the general public and European governments are looking at us to generalize, are looking at us, at us again and saying, oh no, where have you guys gone? So there have been a series of huge divergent uh, views over security matters between Donald Trump and Europe divisions that you have never seen since perhaps Eisenhower uh, condemned the UK and France for bombing Egypt and that a nadir in US European relations in 1956. First comes the issue of burden sharing inside of NATO and President Trump's insistence that European governments spend more on national defense and contribute more or the US will withdraw from NATO. Now, so far his advisors, historically his advisors, every single one of his advisors that he's fired uh, kept President Trump from actually acting on his threats and withdrawing the United States from NATO. It would be uh, catastrophic for US European relations um, if, if he actually does this. And perhaps if he's reelected, he will do this because he won't have anyone to stop him. But um, several secretaries of state and secretaries of defense have stopped him from doing that. But nevertheless, this is a huge point of tension between at least the White House and uh, European governments. The next big uh, blow up, if you will, no pun intended, uh, that separates Europe and the United States is the US decision to aband abandon the Joint Comprehensive Plan for Iran nuclear program or the J5 plus one agreement, the joint action plan, joint comprehensive plan. And this is where the United States unilaterally said that Iran was not meeting the conditions of the agreement, even though they were, and withdrew and decided to impose harsh penalties on Iran. And they just imposed more penalties on Iran and the Iranian government this morning. And the Europeans are remain committed to this agreement. And on the right, you see President Macron's efforts to flatter President Trump, which has been the strategy of Elise Macron and some other Europeans, not Merkel, to try to keep Trump on board through flattery. But this hasn't worked uh, to a large extent. Next, or area of tension has been with the withdrawal, quote, withdrawal of US troops on the Turkish-Syrian border and the abandonment of Kurdish allies uh, on that area. Now, Turkey was particularly thrilled about this because they could take offensive actions against uh, the Kurdish separatists that they believed were uh, exercising terrorist movements um, against Turkey. But the Europeans said, oh my gosh, if the Americans are willing to abandon as good of an ally as the Kurds in Iraq, then they probably could abandon us as well. Then come the huge tensions over the admission of Russia to G7. And unfortunately, I forgot to include the infamous photo of of Merkel and other European allies and at the G7 meeting huddled over President Trump, uh, arguing with him as he had his hands closed. And that is President Trump's view that Russia should be admitted into the G7. Now, if we were to talk about US-Russia relations, which I'm sure Professor Tsagankov has already talked about, in my mind, they're kind of schizophrenic. In my mind, you have the defense establishment and the State Department viewing Russia as a threat and imposing sanctions on Russia. But President Trump has this strange fetish of, of President Putin. And yet, and so he will not say anything, President Trump, critical of President Putin. And some of you already know about many of the things I'm talking about. And yet, President Trump criticizes Germany for allowing uh, for the continuation of the building of the natural gas pipeline between Russia and Germany. So it's a bit strange what exactly is US-Russian uh, foreign policy and what are its motivations. And um, I'm not going to get into conspiracy world, uh, but there is something weird about US-Russia relations and Trump-Putin relations 
that seem to divide US and Europe, despite the things that unite them, such as Russian interference in European elections, um, as well as in American elections. Then there's the division over China and Huawei's uh, expansion of 5G network that the Trump administration as opposed to Huawei, a Chinese, partly Chinese owned company, um, uh, building the 5G network in the United States and should not be built in Europe. Then of course, is the US withdrawal from the Paris Climate Accord almost within the first year of the Trump administration. And then internal divisions uh, where US friendly, uh, the Trump administration has been friendly with Polish, Hungarian, UK, United K, UK Independence Party, French, Italian, and right-wing populists. So basically who should be um, given the cold shoulder in Europe is given a warm handshake uh, by President Trump. Then we come to what's really been the problem is a trade war between the US and the EU. So within the first two years of the Trump administration, Trump imposed tariffs on coal and, oh, coal and I always say coal, and, steel and aluminum, cheese and wine. So we all know about the steel and aluminum tariffs that were imposed on China uh, in 2018 and 2019, but they also apply to all kinds of other uh, countries, including Europe. And Trump has also threatened to put tariffs on cars, on German-made cars um, and other European cars here in the United States. And the EU has retaliated with tariffs on bourbon, motorcycles, and rice in an effort to influence the 2018 uh, midterm elections. There continues to be a trade war between the United States and Europe over Airbus and Boeing. And that doesn't look like it's gonna be solved anytime soon and tariffs will continue to go up. The United States or Trump supported the Leave campaign in the UK and President Trump has supported a free trade agreement with the UK as soon as the divorce agreement between the UK and the EU is signed. Although if Biden is um, elected president, that probably won't happen. Um, the status of Northern Ireland uh, is still in question uh, in regards to the, the uh, Good Friday Accords. The threatened U.S. With, and the impact that Brexit would have. There's a threatened U.S. draw from the International Postal Union. The, and I bring up the International Postal Union because it's the oldest international organization currently running in the world. It's the oldest international agreement. And the International Postal Union is a, an agreement that allows mail and shipping to go from one country to the other such that all countries recognize um, the stamps and mail systems of, uh, in all these member states. And President Trump threatened to blow it up and withdraw from it uh, because he thought China was getting too good of a deal on shipping costs. And finally, President Trump has been quite clear in his rhetoric that he thinks European integration is a threat which is uh, to the United States and is seen as um, a threat to American economic um, uh, strength, uh, which is completely uh, opposite of what US foreign policy has been for the last 60, 70 years. So it's not surprising that European public opinion of, um, of the United States as well as President Trump has gone way down. So on the left, what you see interesting is a partisan divide uh, about the EU between Democrats and Republicans, where Republican perceptions of Europe have gone way down, while Democratic perceptions of the EU have been relatively constant. And you can blame President or yeah, hold res Trump's rhetoric responsible for the decline in the, uh, uh, of approval of the EU among Republicans. And on the right, what you see is that approval for the United States has gone way down in most European countries, Germany, France, Spain, and the UK, Italy, um, but actually gone up in some areas that you would consider a security threat like Russia and then Israel is a country we can deal with later. Or Professor Kaplan can address uh, later about why that public opinion remains so high. So what will happen next week if either Biden wins or Trump wins? My prediction is that if Biden wins, that they're going to try to recreate the bonds between them. They'll be staying together stronger, at least make efforts to do so. That the common security threats of Russia and Iran's nuclear program 
will bring them together. It's going to be very difficult for the United States to come back to the table and rejoin the agreement, given uh, how much punishment they have imposed on Iran in terms of sanctions. So the United States would have to come very, very far away from its current position in order to rejoin the agreement. But nevertheless, um, uh, a President Biden probably would want the US to rejoin it. They probably will rejoin the Paris, agree Paris Climate Agreement, and somehow they're going to have to lessen the effects of the trade war between the United States and, and the EU. Um, how that is all done and how quickly it happens is, a, is quite uncertain. Given how far uh, President Trump has taken US-European relations um, into uh, a different world, it's hard to know how quickly and certain that they can come back. Plus, finally, there may be some coordinated economic stimulus um, uh, during COVID or after COVID. However, if President Trump is reelected, my prediction is that it would lead to a permanent drifting apart of the two regions. There will be permanent distrust, European distrust of US institutions and parties and the quality of democracy in the United States. And that's a separate discussion right now we could have um, of really, you know, what is the Republican party? Does it even belong in a set of mainstream parties um, uh, in, in advanced industrialized world today? Or is it really just now a far right party that's comparable uh, to um, far right parties, right wing populist parties in Europe today? The EU will pursue its own security strategy um, there will be increasingly a strong perception that Europeans and Americans are just different, that, um, that the Europeans are committed to science and environmental climate control, while the Americans are anti-science science and committed to 20th century technologies for energy, that the Europeans are committed to a cosmopolitan world of accepting diversity and secular values versus the isolationism and uh, fundamentalist religious values of the United States. Soft capitalism versus the cowboy capitalism, where the United Europe tries to remain committed to welfare state capitalism versus the low tax, low regulated, and highly unequal American uh, society. And then the Europeans will argue, hey, look at Trump and the administration. It's uh, the United States really on a sign of decline. The empire is crumbling. On the other hand, the Americans and others will, and the Chinese will increasingly say, Europe, you're just less and less relevant in the world today. You have fewer people, your economies aren't as big as ours, the Chinese will say, and simply you're less relevant in the world. The last thing I wanna say though, is that in both the United States and in Europe, whether Biden wins or Trump wins, is that there are fierce internal disputes that are going to hamper cooperation between them. In Europe, I can take more questions in the Q&A, but it's the rise of right-wing populism and what to do about semi-authoritarian regimes or outright authoritarian regimes in Poland and Hungary. And there's huge divisions within Europe about how to handle those issues. In the United States, we have the issues of civil rights, um, and uh, um, even just the quality of our democracy is at stake, I think, next week. Um, if President Trump is reelected, I do think that the United States is going to be at a turning point in terms of how long we actually can we call ourselves uh, a democracy. And I don't mean that in a normative sense, but I mean that as a scholar of comparative politics. There are many ways in which we look at uh, the the criteria for a democracy. And one criteria is majority rule. And if President Trump wins uh, next week with the electoral college and not with the popular vote, or the US Supreme Court intervenes and prevents the counting of votes as they seem to indicate they would like to do based on rulings yesterday, then we have to really question uh, again the quality of democracy in the United States. And not that that can't be done in some European countries as well, which I can talk about in the Q&A. The bottom line is if Biden is elected, US and Europe will recommit to their marriage, but um, they will look at each other askance, but especially the Europeans will look increasingly at the Americans at, uh, with more and more skepticism and say, look, 
is this the person you've elected and governed your country for four years? And not you, meaning not only Americans, but the Republican Party supported him. And the Europeans increasingly will say, that was very traumatic. And despite now the election of Biden, they can't forget that type of trauma. If President Trump is elected, it will be traumatic uh, for everybody um, and will be traumatic for US-European relations. So um, I thank you all for your attention. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions um, you may have um, and any details that you'd like me to go into further uh, depth. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Scott. Uh, I really appreciate uh, your analogy. Uh, to a marriage uh, on the rocks. Um, and um, I just wonder who could mediate uh, or be the marriage counselor for the two parties. Um, it doesn't no seem one. like- it's up to them. Yes, okay. Uh, we have a few minutes um, and maybe we'll do one question for each speaker. And let's see. Um, uh, what about uh, Professor Darling? There's a question here. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the Chinese effort in Latin America? Oh yes, I mean that's a that's a really important point. Um, that as the U.S. has really withdrawn its interest in Latin America, the Chinese have stepped in, and also. One of the point, one of the issues that has arisen is that when the U.S. Um, has supported Latin America either with military or with money, it has placed conditions on that support. The Chinese don't place conditions, and so that has become very attractive to uh, to many Latin American countries because basically they don't have to to satisfy demands from a, from an outside from an outsider they can do whatever they want and as long as the chinese get their money or get whatever it is that they agreed to they will you know they will uh they'll take care of the project they also the chinese have um have no restrictions on giving bribes and that's attractive to uh to many uh people in government in latin america and so uh, and, the, and the Chinese, but also the Chinese come in and they bring everybody who does a project. There's like no, there are no local hires. And people are always in Latin America so impressed by how quickly they do it, but it's because they're bringing in people and machinery with all of this expertise. They're not low, hiring anybody locally. They're not developing any skills locally, but yeah, they can get it done really fast. Okay, thank you very much. Um, sure. we, we do need to mention uh, uh, the Belt and Road Projects of China, which has the entire world uh, as its potential application. Uh, and uh, Xi Jinping is looking at 75 nations uh, involved with uh, China and uh, Chinese foreign policy is a fascinating topic that we talked a little bit about last week, but it certainly deserves more discussion. Professor yeah, I'm, Bob, um, there is a question. Um, there are several questions, but let me try to um, combine uh, several. What do you think needs to happen for Palestine and Israel to have more normal relations? Uh, that's for me? Yes. Okay, well, I think that I think we need to actually switch the whole conversation around and not to think about Palestine and Israel as big entities because they're not equal. It's very asymmetrical condition. I think we need to ask maybe what would it take for people who are living in Palestine and who are living in Israel as quote unquote geographically defined as per international relations theory and political science, which I believe is very restrictive. What does it mean for people to come in? My vision is that people need to come together and actually create a different imaginary where people can actually work with each other so there isn't a privileging 
of whoever are seen as Israeli Jews, because Israel also includes Palestinians and includes all sorts of other people. But how would, what would it mean to actually this privilege, the, the privileges that Israeli Jews per se have, and especially Israeli Ashkenazi Jews, vis-a-vis -vis Palestinians, African asylum seekers, even though Sudan, by the way, is saying they're going to take some of them, Ethiopian Jews, Jews of Arab descent, and so on. What does this, what would this mean, as well as Palestinians who are the indigenous people of the land? What would it mean? How can we envision something different? By the way, the same question can be asked of the US as well. What does it mean for us to actually be able to come together and think of a different kind of future? Different kind of future where everybody actually participates with each other without fear of discipline, without fear of surveillance, without fear of being thrown in prison, without fear of actually being seen as unequal or lesser equal citizen. What does this mean, even if we want to apply the citizenship theory of T.H. Marshall with all the critiques and so on? What would this mean? And I think this is part of the problem that people are not willing to imagine because there is kind of this commitment to Israel as a quote unquote Jewish and democratic state, which is a huge farce. It doesn't really work. You're either Jewish or you're democratic. You can be both. Okay. So if you're actually criticizing Iran about Muslim and Iranian and so on, why isn't that being applied to Israel as well? So I, hope, I think the whole exceptionality business is also needs to be applied. And I think also there needs to be kind of like modification of international relations theory and political science per se, not to think about the most dominant ways of states and you know, but actually think about also what do the people mean with all their diversity. So I want to really see Israelis come and actually Israeli Jews and Israeli Palestinians and Israeli Ethiopians and Israeli um, uh, people of Arab descent and so on, all come to and Palestinians of all sorts of threats and so on, come together and see how can we build a different kind of imaginary? How can we build a different? And I'm speaking now, not only as a scholar, I'm also speaking as a Palestinian myself, that I would really like to see how can we do the whole land between the river and the sea in a way that's more democratic, that's more humane, that doesn't have all this militarization, that doesn't have all these weapons, that doesn't think about quote unquote geopolitical things, but actually envision something different. And some people think this is too utopian. I actually don't think this is the case. I think there have been many ex experiences in history that show that oppression always goes away. It, 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 it says for a while period, for a long period, but at one point, this is, this is where people are at. And this is where, where my vision is at. So this is what I would like really to see. I would like to see something different. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, the word humanitarian seems to apply to the vision that you have to really look at people and not necessarily uh, mm -hmm. uh, geopolitical strategies, uh, which I think is uh, fascinating and something that we have in, in the history of international politics. But we need to move on. And uh, Professor Kaplan, there is a question regarding, you were talking about what if Biden or um, Trump wins uh, we know that um, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu will be gone uh, soon, either by the election agreement or perhaps as a result of criminal uh, prosecution. What does Israel look like, in your view, post Netanyahu? Well, you're making a few assumptions here. We don't know if he's gone. He has three trigger mechanisms in the current coalition agreement that gives him an out before he has to relinquish power to his second in command, Benny Gantz. And he almost used one of them already, but he has one coming up in December, then another one in March. So very few people believe that the current coalition agreement will be fulfilled and he will evacuate office voluntarily. The other is what will happen with the criminal proceedings. But based on precedence, this type of very complicated trial that involves millions of pages of documentation, he could drag it for five or six years easily, just this proceedings. So I would not rush to see an Israel without Netanyahu all that quickly or this soon. The thing that ultimately might bury him is the way he handled COVID. Uh, and that we'll have to see kind of the, the uh, 
how this would uh, reverberate in the Israeli public opinion. But I will not be quick to bury Netanyahu. But right now, the person who seems most likely to succeed him is actually Naftali Bennett, who on most issues is to the right of Netanyahu. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, one should uh, begin to imagine in Israel under Bennett, who, yeah, if you take issue by issue on almost all of them, he's actually to the right of Netanyahu. All right. Thank you. Uh, Professor Siegel, there, are, there is a question. You had uh, on one of your slides a reference to uh, global warming and climate change, but you didn't uh, comment uh, verbally. And there is a question about hostilities between the United States and Europeans regarding climate change and global warming. Can you speak about the alliance and the issue over climate change? Well, I think like, most times when we generalize about two regions or two countries, we can we overlook differences. And when it comes to climate change, clearly you can see an alliance between the US left and most Europeans. And that except A, the science of climate change and B, have to radically re-engineer their economies to adjust to that, okay? And in Europe, there's been the difference between the US and Europe will be that businesses and corporations in Europe have adjusted to the fact that regulatory change and climate change, but mostly regulatory change is coming. And Europe is much further along in making regulatory change to, changes to adapt to climate change than the United States is. Um, that's not to say that the United States can't and won't take significant actions if Biden is elected. Uh, if Trump is reelected, there won't be any uh, efforts here in the United States to respond to climate change. If anything, like the last four years, the situation in the United States will get much worse, okay? And there will be no efforts made by, um, by the United States to cooperate on international climate systems. Now, that's really horrible if that, well, it's horrible for a lot of reasons, but <laughs> it's <a> horrible, <laughs> there's personal view, sorry. Um, it would be um, horrible for cooperation because you need the United States on board to have any significant effect on combating climate change. Nevertheless, the Europeans probably will say, we're going to engineer our way out of this. We're going to build dikes. We're going to um, uh, have solar wind energy, solar energy, and we're going to find all kinds of ways we can to both uh, protect ourselves from climate change, but also sell the stuff that's needed to protect people uh, from climate change. And the Chinese may come on board since they also know that they have to adapt very quickly. Um, so in the end, it, it's really about value differences. And I don't want to say that the Europeans and Americans are necessarily on uh, different planets. Like was written about 20 years ago, there's this book called Europeans are from Venus and Americans are from Mars. Is that there are plenty of Venetians, if that's the right word, uh, in America and there are plenty of Martians in, uh, in Europe. There's no doubt about that. And I don't want to paper over those differences. Um, but on the whole, with the exception of very poor areas of Central and Eastern Europe, Europeans are on board with climate change and it's this country that is so polarized over the issue of climate change. That's probably what makes Europe and the United States different is that we're far, far more polarized on the issue of climate change and what to do about it than Europeans are. My, that's, I think that's right. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm sorry uh, that we don't have more time for some of the excellent questions, uh, but we have overstayed our allotted time. So let me just say um, a deep thanks to uh, Professors Kaplan, Darling, Siegel, and Abdu Habi, and uh, for a fascinating session this afternoon that has also been uh, extremely informative. And I want to invite the members of the public who have not received my email message to log on next week at the same connection that they've used for the election returns. Uh, and we won't invite any of the faculty back who have made predictions and ask them to uh, justify them. Uh, we will behave 
the same way that they do in the mass media, uh, Juanita, uh, and just ignore the predictions uh, and move forward. So I hope to see you next week uh, during our election night coverage. Thanks again to our four speakers this afternoon for a terrific session. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.